Hello again and welcome to the Master's Voice. I'm Celestial and you are welcome to this channel. To old and new subscribers alike, you are very welcome. Today I am going to be covering a video that is somewhat different from the norm. From time to time when I bring these prophetic messages, it begins to come upon my heart that what will help the message go in better is a little bit of understanding out of the word of God. Now, this is not a place where I do Bible studies. So this is not a place that I will do that. But this particular thing, ever since I made the last video called A People of Madness Part 2, this particular thing has kept coming to my heart throughout the remainder of the week that it would be good to show people out of the scripture especially those who are struggling with accepting that, for instance, evil spirits can enter into people who are born again because they can. And struggling with the idea of evil spirits in the first place or anything like that. I just, a few scriptures kept coming to my heart and I'm just going to look at them so that as I continue speaking on these issues and whatever other issues the Lord brings to my heart, we can really understand that Sin is not just, for instance, something that the, the church nowadays is uh, leaving in the back room. So sin is almost like this embarrassing relative that pastors don't want to acknowledge is part of the Christian family anymore. So we just think, and when I say we, I am not including myself, but the greater Christian body truly believes now in this modern time that if we only sow to love, if we only speak love to people, then people will have a true grasp of what of what Christianity is and of who God is. So if we only give people things that will give them hope, especially because life is so hard, Life is becoming so challenging. Not that life does not have its bright and beautiful points, but because life is becoming so challenging and because life is becoming so difficult for so many people, many people feel as if they are sinking or drowning and they feel greatly and not for no reason that they are not coping. So churches have at least two decades ago decided that it would be better to point out the highlights of Christianity. So let's get people focused on healing and let's get people focused on grace. Let's get people focused on love and let's get people focused on what God wants to do for them. God's power, God's ability, God's compassion, God's goodness. Let's, let's highlight those things. But in doing this, whether it was done deliberately or whether it was done just through sloppy application of the whole word of God, what happened is that self-awareness, awareness of consequences for actions, awareness of what sin is and the dangers it poses, not only to Christians, but all people has completely fallen away. So sin has just gone down the mysterious chute of disappearance and you hardly hear about it anymore because people don't like to hear about wrongdoing. People don't actually like to hear that God is not just magic loving Santa. They do not like to hear that God is in fact a whole person just like them, that God has feelings just like them. And just like they don't like to be ignored, they don't like to be used, they don't like to be taken for granted, they don't like to be insulted, they don't like to be provoked. Human beings don't like any of the things that I just named, but nobody really wants to hear teaching that puts God in that light. And God is more deserving of respect, more deserving of honor than any of us. If one of us were to achieve highly in life, we would certainly want our high achievements to be recognized by people. If any of us becomes this or that, we certainly want people to acknowledge those things about us. If we give a gift to someone, we want to be thanked for it. And that is just natural. Even that desire is in the hands and in the hearts of God. But when God is put forward as the first person, for Jesus Christ is the first person of all living. He is the first and foremost. He is the premier. He is God. He is one. When he is put forward in his true and natural person, mm -hmm. unfortunately, that then brings in the question of, 
Am I respecting God in my life? Am I honoring God in my life? Am I selfish towards the Lord? Am I selfish towards others whom God also values and counts dear? Christian teaching that forces us to look at how we live and whether we are mindful as we go through this journey according to scripture. So mindfulness according to what society thinks is good is not mindfulness as God wants it to be. God has his own idea of what respect is, love is, compassion is, selflessness is, sacrifice is. But when you touch on these things towards the modern day church, you're not gonna get much applause, you're not gonna get many likes, whatever this fascination with, with likes is now because social media has taken over the world, suddenly even grown men and women that have been laboring in the fields of God for so long now need to see lots of validation on their videos to let them know that they're pleasing the Lord. I personally say Christianity is towards an audience of one. And therein is my security, me, Celestial. My security rests in the fact that all that I do and all that I say is for an audience of one. So even if nobody watches the videos as nobody once used to watch them, I felt secure in knowing that I was doing what I was called to do and that my audience of one, Jesus, the Heavenly Father, Yah, and the Holy Spirit were pleased with me. And by his grace, I continue in that vein. So today's teaching, I will call it a teaching. Today's teaching is about something very serious that end times Christians and just end times human beings in general need to take into account. And it is about the sanctity of this thing called the body. The teaching is called the owner of the house. There's going to be a lot of Bible reading. So if you want to pause the video and get your Bible because you're going to need it. Today, May 22, 2022, I'm going to be looking at three passages of scripture, one from Mark chapter five, a small piece from Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 to 29, and then a last piece from Matthew chapter 12, verses 43 to 45. So the first part is in Mark chapter five, let me go there, and it is dealing about, it's dealing with this very famous story in the Bible about a man who was possessed with a lot of demons. It doesn't tell us how he came to be that way, but we simply come upon, upon this man as a snapshot of how great the Lord's healing and deliverance power is, and also how strong is the opposition from the kingdom of darkness, is the opposition from Satan. So a lot of people have not been properly educated on the person of the devil, what the devil is capable of, and that the devil is a very orderly person. But as we will look at in the second piece of scripture, which is Matthew 12, 22 to 29, you will see in that scripture that it is mentioned that Satan has a kingdom. Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, well, if Satan is divided against himself, and he casts out himself out of human beings, how then can his kingdom stand? Satan is a very meticulous being. I think that if we could understand the nature of who we have as an enemy, for the Bible tells us not to be ignorant of the fact that we have an enemy, if we could be more aware of the personality and character of the person that we have as an enemy, I truly believe that Christians would be much more interested in making sure that they are having a sanctified walk with Christ than what they're focused on now, which is running after prophecy and, and taking little tests to find out, oh, what my spiritual gift is and going to conferences where they're being um, almost coddled in their biases. Many of these conferences that are being held all over the country are packed to overflowing. But the reason they're packed to overflowing is, let's be honest, it's a lot of people who actually can't hear from the Lord for themselves. They're not practicing the kind of intimacy and they don't know how to build the type of intimacy that will draw God close enough that God will be a voice unto them that comforts them, teaches them, and leads them in such a way that they don't need to travel halfway across the country because a holy man or holy woman is going to be there speaking. I'm not saying that these things are bad. I'm saying that we have to be aware where the desperate hunger for this type of thing it's coming from. It's coming from the fact that 
here in the United States, and I would just expand it globally, most Christians do not have a hearing ear in them anymore. They don't know when it's truly the Lord speaking to them through a human being or speaking to them directly. They're not able to discern his voice. By contrast, Satan is very meticulous. Satan has an agenda and Satan has been working hard on that agenda ever since he kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden, dispossessed them of the inheritance, made them slaves unto sin, his helper. And unless Jesus had come to redeem the inheritance that God had given man, we would still be under the control and under the foot of the devil. But because Jesus Christ has won for us certain things, we are now able to rise above the overwhelming power of sin and the things that sin causes. So Jesus said that Satan has a kingdom and we'll get there, but I just want us to keep in mind that we're not dealing with a scattered and confused personage here. Satan, by saying that he has a kingdom, is an orderly person. Kingdoms is something that God has. God has a kingdom where God is the head and then there is hierarchy. Satan built exactly what he saw in heaven. Satan was the anointed cherub that covers. He knew how that kingdom ran. And when he was kicked out, he simply set up one for himself. It is an extremely orderly kingdom. It is an extremely merciless and compassionless, cold and murdering kingdom. It has no care for the young or the old or the disabled or the healthy. It will snatch the health out of a healthy body and send that person on a fast track to the grave. And so because Jesus said, you have an enemy, if we do not understand who that enemy is, what that enemy is after, and what that enemy is capable of, then we will constantly find ourselves in a life where we are the victim of that enemy and losing. So Mark chapter five is looking at the man who was demonized by the Gadarenes, and I'm simply going to paraphrase, which means I'm not reading exactly verse for verse. I'm reading for clarity, I'm reading for understanding. You can read verse for verse when you have the time, but I'm reading so that this, this video will not be excessively long, but the point will not be missed. And so they came to the other side of the sea in the nation or the country of the Gadarenes. And when Jesus came out of the boat right there, immediately came to meet him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit who lived among those graves and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but the chains had been ripped apart by him and the shackles smashed in pieces, nor could anyone tame him. And always night and day, this man was in the mountains and he was in the tombs crying out, which basically is roaring with a loud, scary voice and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and he worshiped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and he said, what have, what have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he, Jesus had said to him, come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, what is your name? And he answered saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly, please don't send us out of the country. Now there was nearby a large herd of pigs feeding there on the mountains. So all the demons begged Jesus saying, send us to the pigs that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirit went out and entered the swine who were about 2000 pigs. And the entire herd ran violently down to the steepest part and tumbled into the sea and were drowned. And all those who were feeding those pigs fled and they went out into the city and they said everything that, I, that had happened. And they went out to see what had happened. Then they came to Jesus and they saw the one who had been demon possessed and who had had the legion sitting clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who saw how it had happened told it to those who had come and they told how he who had been demon possessed had been and also about the pigs. Then they began to beg Jesus and ask him to leave their country. And so we look at a situation where a human being 
something, something that God has created as an image of himself. We are created in the image of God and God really loves us. The heavenly father truly loves us. We are a carefully and meticulated, um, meticulously created creation. God is not sloppy about anything. So I'm not saying that we are carefully made and then the butterflies or the monkeys are not carefully made, but there is something unique about Adam and there is something unique about Eve. And we are the only creation that the Lord leaned down and put his breath into. All living has a spirit, but we are carrying the father's spirit. We're not carrying whatever giraffes have in them. We're not carrying whatever butterflies have in them, which is a spirit of life after a fashion. We are carrying something direct from God's spirit to us. And if we understand what has been put into us and who we are, then we would be, I am convinced of this, more careful with how we take care of this body, which is the temple of the living God, and how we care for the soul and spirit who are eternal within us and cannot die. What lives inside us cannot die because it comes from God, and it is those two in their soul and spirit that will be judged after life has ended. And so if we are living carelessly because all we see is this external packaging and we also have this false impression that because we are the external packaging, I am celestial and you are whoever you are. So if you start to think that because this is my packaging, I own it, you are very, very wrong. All that we have as mankind is given to us to steward. I will read out some verses towards the end of this video so that we can have better understanding of those things. And so if we know what is inside us is this treasure that we are carrying in this body of clay and Satan is aggressively against that treasure. Satan wants nothing more, please hear me, than to smash the jar, which is this vessel of earth, this vessel of clay and corrupt what is inside. Once what is inside is corrupted, it is unacceptable to the heavenly father and it will not be allowed entry into heaven. I don't know how many videos that I have made that always come back to this point. It doesn't matter if I'm talking about Nephilim, if I'm talking about Russia, if I'm talking about how much sin there is in the world today and here with us in America, AKA mystery Babylon. It always comes back to this. If you take your attention from the fact that Satan is a creature with nothing to lose, Satan can never repent. Satan can never go back to one ship with God. Therefore you're dealing with someone who is so reckless. Satan will not be punished 800 times or 8 billion times or 7 billion times for every single person that he harms. Satan is only going to be punished once, the fallen angels once, the demons once. And therefore to them, since the punishment is set, they have nothing to lose by causing harm to five, 5,000, 500,000, 50,000, 50 million, 500 million, or all living. Satan's goal is all living. This is why the Bible says that the time will be shortened because if not, even the elect would fall to Satan's diabolical and nefarious end times plans. This should show you that Satan has enough energy and enough pride to think he can encompass all of us in his master plan to destroy the race of men so that when God comes back looking among his wheat to see who can be harvested, he will find nothing. This is Satan's hope for God to find nothing. And so we see the condition that Satan can get the human body in. We see that this man was demonized to the point that he had a legion. In Roman times, it's not been exactly agreed upon, but in Roman times, a legion could be anywhere from 3,000 to 6,000 soldiers. So if it's scary for you, hold the number 3,000 in your mind. And if you're braver, hold the number 6,000 in your mind, in your mind, it's either 3,000 or 6,000 demons dwelling in that one person, that many spirits in one person lets you know that that man's human mind was not at home. Therefore, the person who ran to Jesus's feet and worshiped 
was not this man. It was the demons. Pieces of scripture like this show us that even those who have been cast out of heaven are wiser than many of the people that live on the earth today. For many of the people that live on the earth today claim so, so clearly and so confidently that there is no God, that Jesus is a mythological creature, a, a, a throwback from the history books that doesn't even exist. People claim that the, li the living and risen Christ was just an imagination. And they say things like, there's no proof that Jesus was there and things like that. But the demons, upon seeing the Son of God walking in flesh, ran to him and they bowed down and they worshiped him immediately. And when he gave a command and said, come out, they said, what have I to do with you? And they called him by his name, Jesus, and they called him by his title, Son of the Most High God. And they said, I beg you, don't torment me. So it proves that Jesus in his authority had the ability to make these multiple spirits feel pain, feel pain. And they were crying out to him not to judge them because it's not yet their time to be judged. You see them entering into a negotiation with the Lord, send us into the pigs because Jesus was not going to tolerate these spirits living in this temple. He created this temple in his image. The Holy Spirit is the owner of the house. The Holy Spirit is the owner of this vessel. It's not you. It's not me. You are a lodger inside a building that is sacred to God. So if you're out there marking your flesh, ripping it up, you're putting graffiti on the walls of a house that you have not bought and paid for because you don't have the currency. I'm letting you know right now. None of us has the currency to pay for the value of this. If you don't know what the value of a human being is, the value of a human being is Jesus Christ. That's right. What God paid for each one of us was the blood and body of God. Do you have pockets that deep? Can your bank account cover the value of the children that you are aborting America and world at large? Do you have the cash to lay on the table and say, this is what I esteem to be the value of my own flesh? You don't. Because the Bible says, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And the answer we all know is nothing. When the spirit of death comes to take a man's soul, he would give everything in his bank account. He would give all his clothing, all his watches, all his car, all his property. He would be willing to give his relatives in his place so that his life can be, would not be taken. None of us can pay for what we are. This is God's property. And we are charged throughout scripture to scrub this house and keep it clean, to put off the old man, to crucify the flesh with its lusts and walk step by step, hand in hand with God, submitting ourselves to the work of the spirit of God, who is the one completing sanctification in us. When we receive salvation by believing upon the eternal sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, we become filled with a new spirit, even the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 17 to 18. Now the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. That means that where the Holy Spirit is living, there should be no bondages. There should be no ties. There should be no soul ties of the 18 or 25 or even two boyfriends that you had in your past, ones that you were intimate with. There should be no liens on the house. A lien is a, a mark of ownership. For instance, if you buy the house and you're paying it off, the bank has a lien on the house until you finish paying it off. Many people in America found out that the minute you skip one to three payments, you will find out that the house was never yours after all. It belongs to the bank. In this world, we respect the right of ownership of the banks and the credit unions over our physical homes, but we neither pay attention to nor respect the right of ownership of the Lord God over our natural or our spiritual homes. And this is a pity 
And yet the demons have a deeper understanding of what this house is, of the value of this house, and what it really, really means to God. And this is why they are constantly bombarding these houses, trying to break their way in, trying to get in, to possess the house, or at least to oppress the house from outside, because they know that if they can control from within, or at least control from without, by constantly feeding thoughts into the mind that the person then accepts and acts upon, Satan and these demons know that they will eventually take possession of the house. And that is the third piece of scripture we will look at. What happens when Satan basically has cracked the code, entered the house, set up his own alarm system, and is now trying to keep Jesus out of the house? So you are God's temple where the Holy Spirit dwells. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 to 17. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, which is what you are. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19. What? Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God? and that you are not your own. So the Bible backs me up on what I'm saying. You are a lodger in this body. And that is why the Bible says that you will give an account of every word that you have spoken. I will give an account of every word spoken, of every deed that I have done, of every action, and of every deed that I have left undone. For to him who knows he ought to do something and does not do it, it is sin. This is why I'm always saying things like if you have been blessed of the Lord and you have enough and you see people in your life, in your everyday movements who are further down the pole of life than you, and yet you will not take the time or make the sacrifice to even step four or five minutes out of your day to buy someone a meal, to get someone coffee, to hand someone something that will alleviate or lessen the burden of suffering that you can see, but you are waiting for an angel from on high to come and tell you, Todd, you ought to do this. Samantha, you ought to do this. Or you are waiting for a prophetic dream to let you know that your neighbor with all those kids could benefit from groceries. You're waiting for there to be some kind of meaningful spiritual intervention before you can do things that you ought to do. It is sin. And many people are so seared in their hearts anyway, so focused on this me. It definitely is a me too world. It definitely is a me too world. Not the way the world means it. It's more like me first. We are not mindful of our surroundings. We are not mindful of the changes that have come into our living rooms. And so no wonder that the church of Jesus Christ is watching from behind the curtains no wonder life looks scary now because we have sat and we have not participated to such a point that now things are going way left. And I do not mean that politically. And now we feel helpless. Now we feel like we're running to catch up. Now we're feeling like we can't catch our breath. Now we're starting to see all the manifestations of what it looks like, what life looks like, what your nation looks like when Satan is behind the wheel when there is no more open, visible Jesus at work in a nation anymore, then of course it's scary, but it didn't get that way by accident. The reason God says that he will judge this country is because this country systematically broke down the gates and everyone has this word on their lips, elites, elites. I am here to let you know that elites is spelled Y-O-U and M-E. That's how you spell elites. You spell it Y-O-U. For every home that saw children going wayward and thought, oh, but he's just little and I don't want to pressure him and I don't want to limit his natural expression. His natural expression grew up and put on a dress and you sat there. You did sit there. So in all the homes that it happened, that is how we now have the mass movement that we are getting ready to go into next month. It didn't happen in a vacuum. It happened American home by American home by American home, 
until there was enough pressure from the grassroots. The elites did not come around to the door and knock and say, well, would you, we're taking a survey. How many of you would like us to change the law? That's not what happened. The pressure built from the bottom up. We must learn to be honest people if we are hoping to get any mercy from God. I'm going way off what I wrote here, but I will just go with it because before I make any video, I pray and I say, Lord, use my mouth as you desire, as you will. That's what it means to be sold out. That's what it means to be completely given over to the Lord Jesus, his spirit and his agenda. People deny the growth of sin in this country as if the growth of sin is something that happened in their neighbor's house on their neighbor's watch. It happened from the ground up. It happened when the strip clubs became legal. It happened when the prostitution was not so bad anymore. People want to blame the prostitutes as if the, pl the prostitutes are their own clients. Are they? No. Are the prostitutes working for themselves? No. They're working for the men at home. They're working for the married men. They're working for the teen boys who want to make sure that their first time with a real girlfriend is good. So they go and practice on those women and those girls. Those women wouldn't be there if, it, if they did not have a clientele. So it's definitely not coming from the elites. It is coming from the population. People always talk about it as if the government operates in a vacuum. Who votes them there repeatedly over and over? Who is so angry and savage on all the social media boards and, and out in force when somebody who reflects the heart of the nation at a certain time comes out and they think that's our guy, that that's our guy. We're going with that guy. Who puts these people where they are? Inability to look in the mirror and acknowledge wrongdoing. America, if you are wondering why God says that there will be no mercy, please hear me. It starts with the hearts that are walking around, taking the bus and driving around every day. I am so weary of this fake phrase, we're good people. What on earth is, where do these lies come from? Jesus handled that lie in the Bible when he said, there's none good but God, but you tell that to anyone in this nation. They're ready to eat you with peanut butter and jam. What on earth is we're good people? Is this not just an internal lifting of the heart? It's just another way of saying, how dare you hold me accountable? How dare you say that I have anything to do with the way things are? And I bet you every time the Lord sends me here with prophecy to read, I can feel so many people waiting to see if this prophecy will touch their sin, the one that they're doing. And if I don't mention it, then, it, oh, it's those people. God sees all sin. And he is so tired of it. And that's where the judgment comes from. The ability to just acknowledge, the ability to just accept. It is true. I did sit. Even if it was in 76 when the pill came out and this came out and that came out. I did sit. And I did think, well, you know, if it'll keep them quiet for a while. God bless the men who came on the abortion videos and confessed. Yes, yes. I, I didn't exactly tell her to do it, but I was 18 at the time. And when she did, I was relieved. God bless such men who will say it, who will confess. Yeah, my buddy did it. And I told him, well, you know, buddy, it, it's fine because you know your future. You know, we're, we're young. We're only 25. God bless the ones who hear the word of the Lord and then confess. And me too. And me too. Lord, have mercy on such a one as me. How can God be condemning of one who will accept and repent? But because there's no repentance, only hardening of the heart, hardening of the forehead. Why does she keep talking about sin? Because it's killing this country. And because I'm the one sitting here with sheet after sheet after sheet of judgment after judgment after judgment. 
I always have to say in the beginning of these videos, I am not reading out something that just happened yesterday. God gave me these prophecies since 2012. The reason I'm here time after time after time is simply because I'm working through stuff that's already set in stone. And I just have to finish it. So this poor man was filled with between three to 6,000 demons. And that is the condition Satan will get this country into. There will be so many people in the homes that this video is being broadcasted into. You will be watching your loved one who won't stop smoking pot. Because this, this is the home of drug advocacy, right? This is, this is the nation of enablers. The nation that always wants to say, well, you know, we, we can't just get them off the fentanyl. We, we need to slowly bleed them down to smaller and smaller milligrams. And what they will never say, because there's this such a strong advocacy culture to leave the door open, discerning people, and I'm using that word very loosely, are not aware of why the door is kept open. You cannot bind the strong man of demonic spirits if the door is left open for them to come back. I'm going to go straight to that verse. Binding the strong man. Matthew chapter 12. If you have your Bible with you, please turn there. Matthew chapter 12 and verses 22 to 29. Then they brought a man to him who was demon possessed and he was blind and mute. And the Lord healed him, and the blind and mute man spoke and saw. So you see right there that a lot of these sicknesses and illnesses that are being diagnosed as, oh no, this is mental illness, and oh no, this is this and that, the Bible clearly supports the fact that demons can be the cause of sickness. Just like the boy who had all the manifestations of epilepsy and the spirit would wait until there was a fire going when his mother was cooking and then cause the boy to have a seizure and try to throw him directly into the fire or if they would take him down to a river or lake for whatever reason, and or maybe there was water around, then the spirit would manifest a seizure to try and cause the boy to fall into the water. And I've said in a Bible study before, why else would a demon try to throw a human being into fire or water? Is it to warm him and wash him? No, it is to burn him so that he can die from the burns or it is to drown him. The work of the spirits is exactly what they did to the pigs. Jesus did not allow that temple that he loved of the man in the Gadarenes to be in such a condition that he was cutting himself. This is also something that many of you as parents have seen in your children and you've hoped that they, they will grow out of it and they've told you, oh no, it's a cry for help. It's a cry for help. Actually, it's a demonic manifestation. It is a demonic behavior. And why? It's exactly what I explained in the beginning of the video. Satan hates the spirit of God in us. Satan hates the very shape of God that we have been made in. And therefore, Satan tries to desecrate this house as much as possible. This is why people fornicate. This is why people smoke weed. This is why people take hallucinogenics. This is why people commit adultery and abortion and same-sex acts and all of that and pedophilia. All of it distorts and destroys the image of the house in God's eyes. And Satan's work in this earth is to cause each human being to do it enough until the house and what dwells in it is rejected by God forever. That's his only goal. Satan knows he will never hear, well done, well done good and faithful servant. And his only goal in life is to have God tell all of us, depart from me. You who practice lawlessness, I knew you not. And then Satan will say, come, come, my little chicks, come, come with me. All of you belong to me, for all of you have acted as if I am your father and not God. To the lake of fire we go. And so, the multitudes were amazed when Jesus did this miracle, and the man could see, and the man could talk. And they said, could this be the son of David? But the Pharisees were not having it. And they said, no, no, this one, he's casting out demons by Beelzebub, who rules the demons. But Jesus knew what they were thinking. And Jesus said to them, if a kingdom is divided itself against itself, it will come to desolation. And every city or house that is divided against itself will not stand. So if Satan is casting out Satan, 
Then he is divided against himself, and how can his kingdom stand? And if I'm casting out demons by Beelzebul, the king of demons, then who do your followers cast them out by? But if I cast out these demons by the Spirit of God, then surely the kingdom of God has come to you. So right there, Jesus is establishing a principle that Satan has a kingdom and that Satan will not work against his kingdom by casting his kingdom out of people. But the kingdom of God being a higher kingdom of higher power for God is above all is the only kingdom with the power, the means, the resources, the word of confession that is able to cause the kingdom of Satan to scatter, to capitulate, which means to give in, to be defeated and eventually to go. But the demon going, the devil going is not the end of the story, as I will soon carry on explaining in the rest of this message. So Jesus says, if I cast out demons by the spirit of God, then surely you know that the spirit of God has come upon you. For how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Only then can he plunder his house. So Jesus is again referring to the body of humanity as a house. But this time, he not only calls it a house, but he calls what is inside the house goods. And he says that it is possible to have a strong man in that house keeping the goods. Jesus is basically saying that when demons finally manage to crack the code through repetitive sin, and they attach to a person, such as now you can't get rid of the smoking habit, now that you can't get rid of the masturbation habit, now every third dream you have features six women in the bed with you, and the feelings are so real that when you wake up, you see what men have on the body after they have been sexually excited. When the demons are now in control of the house, Jesus says that they are now possessing the goods. That means that they have now gripped the inner man of that person. And now this person is what we now call addicted. Now they're basically hiding the habit, especially if they're a Christian, they're desperately hiding that habit. But that's not the only kind of thing. It's not only these physical sins that we can see. There are so many sins of the heart. There's resentment, there's anger, there's bitterness, there's unforgiveness. Demons have so many people imprisoned in inner jails. And yet they walk around with a smile on their face and they're doing their best to pretend that they are okay. But these things are actually quite visible to those who have the eyes to see. And they won't let go of these things or they are incapable of letting go of these things. And so the demon is in there with them, manifest in the things that they think, in the things that they say, and the way that they live. Sin is bondage. And basically the people running that bondage jail are these spirits that come in to possess the house. And this is what the Lord is telling us. This is what God was basically saying in the prophecy about do not take the solution because the solution is one of the things that will break down the door of the house. The harm that causes harm, the harm in the arm and the boosting harms that go after it. This is what the Lord was saying that taking that thing will definitely break down inner spiritual gates and give free access. Just thinking about that prophecy and going over it again, I will link it in the description. Just thinking about it, the Lord said that even children will begin to have what is known as night sweats, nice ter night terrors. If you Google that, that is basically nightmares and dreams featuring the creepy crawlies, the demonic beings and spirits that are so real that when the person wakes up, the bed is drenched with the amount of water that they have perspired in their fear. He said that even little children. Now, is this because God is wicked? No. For how can little children come to have those kinds of dreams by reason of the harm? because the parents of the children take their children out to get the harm that causes harm. Everything is causative. Everything has a cause and effect. And this is one thing that I will always strongly state on this channel. I am not here reading out the vengeful revenge plans of a God who woke up one morning and said, this I will do and this and this also. No, these words of the Lord are coming forth after such long suffering on the part of God after such long forbearance on his part 
watching sin and warning about it. Generation after generation, pastor after pastor has come and preached and prophesied and died. Some of them are now irrelevant. Their teaching is no longer relevant. Nobody wants to hear it. It's not the pastors in the skinny jeans with the seven inch oiled beards and and the slick hair on the side telling you, but God loves you. He loves you. Nobody wants to hear that kind of thing anymore. Nobody wants saving truth, truth that delivers, truth that makes us have to confront ourselves and wrestle through the grace of God until we rule over sin. This is what God said as far back as Cain. That's what he said to Cain. Sin is at the door for you, Cain. It is crouching at the door. To crouch is a defensive, it is an offensive position of a predator. Whenever you, you who own cats, when you see your cat tensed into this little ball and stalking on the rug, you immediately know this thing is either practicing because it's his genetic code to think he's a lion, or you know that there's a mouse nearby or something like that. To crouch is the action of a predator. This shows you that sin sees who as prey. Demons see who as the prey. For we're not crouching, waiting to jump on demons. Yet God said to Cain, sin lies at the door. It crouches at the door and its desire is for you. But you must what? You must rule over that sin. This means that it is the job of Christianity to Find out what it is that the issue is to return to the word of God, to search out the word of God that responds and that deals with that issue, to confess these things to God, and then to enter into the wrestling posture. For if you hear that something is crouching, you're not just going to come and be like, crouching thing, go away from me, crouching tiger and leaping dragon. No. There are actions There is wrestling. There is war. For the Bible speaks of an evil kingdom. And many of the prophecies in the supernatural series are talking about the fact that this evil kingdom has strengthened itself in mankind. Because mankind has not only opened one door, but opened a window and another window and opened even the basement and opened the roof and said, come on in. Mahalalel and friends, Jezreel and all the elves, all the fallen, come in as I continue to do this action and this action and this action. But Jesus is saying that even though the strong man binds up the goods, that's us. He says that he, Christ Jesus, has the authority to bind the strong man. And when the strong man is bound, then his goods, that's us, can be delivered, can be rescued out of his hand. The last piece of scripture I will look at here is still in Matthew chapter 12, and we're going to look just at three short verses to let you know that Satan doesn't let go of the house. He doesn't just hand over the house keys and say, okay, Lord Jesus, I hear you. My kingdom is weaker. I capitulate. I give in. You can move back in and be the Lord and master of this house. It doesn't work like that. Matthew chapter 12, verses 43, 44, and 45. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and he takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it be also with this wicked generation. So this is the picture of what happens when somebody has taken the time, the pastor has taken the time, or you have taken the time, you've identified your issue, and you have listened to the word of God about that issue, it is good to listen to good teaching. It is good to listen to these seasoned and well-trained men of God who have actual fruit in their lives. doesn't matter if this person has passed away. That's why this modern age, the Bible, um, Daniel was told that in the end, 
there would be much knowledge, there would be much learning, and people would run to and fro seeking after knowledge. So that is neither a good thing or a bad thing. There are people who are running to and fro, going to the UF channel, UFO channels, and waiting for their blonde gods to come back. And there are people who are running to and fro and discovering their roots in ancient Egypt and saying, yes, uh, we were kings and the pharaohs. And yes, there's all of that. You can choose to be someone who's running to and fro, going to the websites of fathers of the faith who truly understood the themes and the doctrines of Christianity and listening to their teaching. If the issue is hatred or unforgiveness, go and find those teachings and immerse yourself under them and stop thinking that you can cut those binding ties by yourself. Have you ever seen a bound man setting himself free? Is it possible for someone who is chained up and is under the domination of a strong man to suddenly turn into the one who sets himself free. Bound people need to be delivered. So you go and get the necessary information. But it says that when the spirit is driven out, whether through deliverance or whether through you have found this information, you have found good websites with prayer points, you have coupled this with, with fasting, you have coupled this with scripture and calling upon the Lord and said, Jesus, I'm not going to stop striving until I am set free. But now it says, eventually the spirit is driven out of a man and the spirit goes out there into the wild west where it says he's looking for rest. Rest for demonic spirits doesn't actually mean that they want to sleep. It means that they want to do what they did with that man who was in the tombs. They want a body to live in. So the spirit will go out and look for someone else who has the doors and windows of their life open. Someone who is living irresponsibly, someone who is not living a sanctified and God submitted life, but who is walking in the ways of the world, walking in the ways of demons and the doctrines of demons. Sometimes you don't even need to be committing any physical sin. All you need to be doing is opening your mind up to all these extra philosophies. I get Christians coming here and talking about their third eye. I just wanna let you know that you are in the wrong spot for that. Because in this channel, there's only four eyes. There's the two that we have, and then there's the eye of the spirit. If you have a fifth one, you are in the wrong place. So many Christians have gone and mingled what is unholy with what is holy. They're, they're living holy lives, but when they're legalizing marijuana, they're all over that because, oh no, you know, it's, it's healing and therapeutic properties and all that. All these are the things that I get to observe by reason of serving the Lord in this way. And all I can tell you is that the mind also has doorways. There are many people in history who documented went crazy after postulating ideas in which they said that nothing means nothing and everything means nothing and there is no God. Friedrich Nietzsche is one of those. I even wrote it in one of my posts on Facebook that it is so interesting, this modern society and who it will idolize. A man who said that God is not there and wrote all these supposedly brilliant writings and by age 44 was out of his mind and spent the rest of his life literally drooling and being cared for by his mother. This is, this, these are some of Western society's heroes the God deniers who don't end well, but you know, while they had their mind and wrote and supported the things that they supported, then these things are being taught in the centers of learning today so that your children can grow up in the same manner and in the same vein and in the same beliefs. And then when your children come home as total strangers and all the doors and windows of their soul have blown open because of the entry of ideas that bring after them spirits that destroy and tell you, mom, I know my name is Kathy, but I'm marrying Samantha and I need you to support me. Then in your heart as a believing mother or father, you're grieving and you don't know how this happened. But as I said, cause and effect, nothing happens without nothing. Everything is traced back to a root to a origin. And many people don't want to do the work of going into their weedy, overgrown gardens and starting to rip up the roots with the help of the Holy Spirit who is with us at all times and offers his hand at all times to help us get these unclean spirits out. 
So the unclean spirit will go out looking for rest, looking for another body. And it says that he goes through dry places and he can't find rest. And then he says to himself, no, 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 this is unacceptable for me. Yes, I was evicted by the power of Jesus, but I'm not going to stay out here in this desolate wet wilderness and suffer. I'm going back to the house. I'm going to check if that house is secured. And it says he comes back and he finds the house empty, but swept and put in order. So we've all moved into a new apartment before and we've cleaned it before we moved in and it was empty and swept and it was waiting for us to bring stuff in. There's a lot of people who will get their deliverance and then instead of filling themselves with the word of God, they will not break off the old habits that set them free, but they will go back to it. They will go back to hanging around the women that trigger their sexual urges and make them masturbate. They will go back to wearing the minus 2% clothing and going back to the same bars, hanging out with the same friends. And before you know it, you're back to picking up the same men and then we'll soon be back to the dreams where you see dragons and demons and eight foot men coming to touch you at night. And then you're wondering, but how? It is because when Jesus told that naked woman who was caught in the act of adultery, go and sin no more, he was giving a spiritual and powerful key. When we are delivered from sin, we do not return to the sin. We fence off our life so that the unclean spirit will not come back to the house and find it empty. Sometimes the emptiness is because we do not break off the old habits. We don't break off the old crew that we used to run with. Sometimes the fact is that you get your deliverance and then you don't maintain it. So you don't continue to walk in spirituality. You don't continue to have the same prayer time and singing time with Jesus that you developed when you desperately wanted to be healed of the past pain, healed of the past issues, set free from the past controlling sins. When we're free and we're no longer having the bad dreams and, and stuff in our house is no longer smashing for no reason, doors aren't slamming for no reason, we don't see the evil presence in the kitchen anymore, our baby isn't screaming and waking up with scratches on their face or whatever the case may be, then people tend to fall back into a relaxed posture. And yet the Bible tells the, ar the church that we are an army, beautiful, with banners. But then everybody wants to opt out of the army and relax because now it's time for Pastor Bob to cover us again and tell us things that make it easier for us to cope. And it says that when the house comes back, when, when the demon comes back and finds the house empty, what he will do is he will not risk Jesus casting him out so easy. So it says he will go and take with him seven other spirits that are stronger than him. So if this was smoking, definitely it's now being upgraded to marijuana and then quickly to crack. It will no longer be smoking the little puffy cigarettes that I see everyone with nowadays. I can never remember e-cigarettes. So it's no longer just doing that for the nicotine hit. This time it's going to be mixed with weed and now it's quickly going to ask, escalate to these other things that trip people out of their head. Why? People think, I wonder why he upgraded to hard drugs. I, I wonder why he made that decision. The demon that was in him with the small sin the first transgression made that decision for him because this time the demon wants to make sure that the next time a pastor or a preacher or whoever comes along to confront the house, this time there's not one guy in there, but now there's eight, seven more spirits more wicked than him, which makes the work of the pastor harder, which makes the work of the person who's praying for you harder. Because this time the demon has backup. And Jesus says that the final state of that person is worse than it was at first. And so this is a clear look at what the Lord is saying when he says a people of madness. This is not madness as in he did that to me. I'm so mad. This is actually I'm out of my head by the action of spiritual wickedness that has taken advantage of what goes into my eyes, what comes out of my mouth, which is coming from my heart. What comes out of the mouth is a very good snapshot to what's going on in there. A lot of people don't know that. They think their conversation is salted with salt and yet it's so bitter and acrid, like acid sloshing around in the belly. It's evidence to other things going on, but because those things have not been fished out and cast out, the water comes out sour every time. Jesus is always telling us the truth in the word of God. 
But because there is a famine of the word of God, you cannot find people these days telling the truth on YouTube. It is so unpopular. It is so not what people want to hear and click on and forward. People just want to forward that good times are coming. People have been lying that good times are coming for six, seven, nine, ten years. I just watch. The good times must be coming on the slowest camel because all that is coming is this great reset, this loss of personal property, this overreach of international governments that say they will take everything away from people. And they know why they are saying it because in the new world order, you're not supposed to be happy and you're not supposed to own anything. You are meant to be a marching drone in Satan's army, doing Satan's things and getting chipped with scannable eyes and all sorts of other things. So the good times that are coming, it must be coming out of another Bible that I do not possess. But here on the master's voice, I will keep it real until the Lord says to me, Celestial, you've done enough. You can stop. And so a people of madness, part two, the prophecy that I just did a few days ago is not a prophecy that is coming out of nowhere. It is a prophecy that is coming out of the Lord's heart to let his people know how we will end up institutionalizing or hearing that people we know are being institutionalized. It is because of the ideas that are getting into the mind, that are settling into the heart like dirty water. If you have a heart that is a God-denying heart because you're always on these transhumanist channels and this and that and all the stuff that people are watching saying they're trying to gain more knowledge on it, just understand that the mind has the helmet of salvation on it, but the helmet of salvation is not made of plutonium or titanium. The helmet of salvation is the word of God. And so if you've got more going into this head than word, more videos, more articles, more whatever, even more anything that you want to think of going into this head more than the word, your helmet is going to get paper thin. And when Satan draws back the bow, it's going to go right here, right here. That's how people become a people of madness, constantly filling prescriptions that in your heart, the Holy Spirit has told you six years ago, Melinda, it is time you weaned off these. It is time you weaned off these. I'm not against medication that is necessary for immediate pain, immediate struggle. But six years after an injury, you're still feeling that thing. You have to know that the hook is already in your mouth. And the thing with Satan is that Satan is like these skilled fishermen. I do not like fishing. But I know that many people do. And from what I understand, skilled fishermen who know that they have gotten a big one are not just going to pull on that thing because it's possible to tear the gill of a fish and a fish is willing to swim out there and live another day with a piece of the face gone. It doesn't mind. So what they do is when they first feel the struggle, they will reel out the line and let that guy go for a little bit. And the devil is doing a lot of that with people saved and unsaved. Satan is as patient as a most patient thing. I have said it and said it and I will always say it. The devil is never going to take down one person if, if he can take down two. So if you're a woman, for instance, with promiscuity in your heart that you are not confessing to the Lord Jesus Christ, just wait. Satan is going to trouble you a little bit as a single person, but he's not going to do much. He's waiting for a man to trust you. He's waiting for a man to love you with that demon, that monkey riding your back. He's waiting for you to get married. And then as he's watching that marriage, she's even thinking, oh, I could cause havoc here, make her cheat. Not yet. He's going to wait for you to have the baby. And you guys have already sent out three years worth of Christmas cards with the baby. Then the affair comes. That way there's the devastation of fighting over who gets the baby. Then there's the devastation of that man losing his mind when he thought he had found somebody that he could trust for the rest of his life. That's Satan. He will never take down one if he can take down two. He'll never take down two if he can take down five. So if he can wait until you are a family of teens and then the affair comes, then everyone is like, dad, how could you do this? And Satan is laughing and laughing and laughing because the ricochets of the betrayal of the adultery, the brokenness of wife and husband, the rage of the sons at their father for doing this, the rage and the vulnerability of the daughter for doing this, the fact that the sons might be so affected by this, 
that it can even make them question sexuality or it can make them promiscuous or it can make them almost monk-like. Now they can't trust women or they can't trust something. Sin is this root that puts out branches. It'll never be one if it can be five. It'll never be five if it can be 80. That's the devil always going for the major score. This is Celestial with the master's voice. The title of this teaching is the owner of the house. Who owns the house that you are living in? America, Uganda, Netherlands, China, Russia. Who owns the house? May 22, 2022. Thank you for tuning in with me. This is the master's voice. God bless each and every one of you who continue to bless and uplift this ministry in prayer with your gifts. May the Lord bless you and return it back to you. And until I see you again, goodbye.